The Art of Being Ruled. Wyndham Lewis. Original Publication 1926. 1989 Edition. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Part 13. Beyond Action and Reaction. Chapter 2. Beyond Action and Reaction. This essay is a statement of a position that would be entirely irreconcilable, but irreconcilable outside of the cadres and clichés of any recognized federated opinion. Above all, it would seek to dissociate from the pure revolutionary impulse of creative thought all those corrupt imitations which confuse so much the issue, in their overnight utilitarian travesties. The agency it naturally envisages is that of spiritual ascendancy or persuasion, with the avoidance of all violence as an article of faith. It is nothing but a rough working system of thought for the wild time we live in. Committed to one theory or another of revolution, to something radical and deliberate, that is, in capitulating about your divorce, in consequence, from the world of sentiment and quiet animal growth, it is well to remember that every one is a rebel today, to some extent. So your natural opponents will all be revolutionaries, all modern. A flag, a badge, or a uniform is, under these circumstances, no indication of friend or foe. The statement of a position beyond action and reaction is our aim. That would be something as irreconcilable as primitive Christianity, as radical as the truest speculative thought, which type of things are, as I have tried to show, the very source of revolution. I believe what I have outlined must in this sense be the attitude of the European of the future. He must be neither a good European nor a bad European, but, in short, a beyond the good and bad European, if anything at all. To parody another famous saying by a great phrasemaker, it could be said that you must drive your plow over the bones of the unborn. Use your revolutionary impulse as a magic carpet to transport you constantly into the future, this will act healthily on your present. You will fly back to your present to see how it is progressing, and will find it very slowly sprouting with less impatience than if you were unable to imagine its ever becoming anything else but what it is. The naively conventional revolutionary is a stereotyped, routine protocol of a living activity, vulgarized for the purposes of mass use. It is really only put into the form of revolution to make it comprehensible. But what is asserted here is, further, that this vulgarized version is apt, by the religious tenacity with which it is held, to affect its original authors. Such extremely highly organized vulgarization as exists today is productive of that. But all creative activity at the best of times must have been influenced, if not controlled, by political necessity. Von Hartmann finds it amazing that Locke's sensationalism should have dominated the 18th century as it did. The intellectual domination of certain schools of thought today would similarly seem amazing to some von Hartmann of the future. What happens is, however, that in every epoch thinkers of different, opposite types occur, there is always a Leibniz and always a Locke. It has been the political tendencies of the time that make one or the other prevail. The phenomenon noticed by Benda, namely, that today, in the intellectual world, there is no opposition, is caused by the infinitely higher organization of our time. This enables politics to dominate speculation and invention in a way it has never done before. There is virtually no intellectual opposition in Europe. Julian Benda, for instance, is a very marked exception. Similarly, there is no real criticism of existing society. Politics and the highly organized, deeply entrenched, dominant mercantile society has it all its own way. Proust, who may come to mind, is not a critic of the society he described. He is a partisan as much as is the novelist writing for the millionaire Mayfair public, he likes every odor that has ever reached him from the millionaire society he depicts, while, of course, thoroughly competent to appreciate its weak spots. Whether this is a good thing or a bad in principle, where pictures of contemporary habits are concerned, it is certainly crippling for more abstract activities. The proof of this political ascendancy over thought is not difficult to grasp. The history, geography, etc., that a child is taught are not conceived as science but as a political pabulum flavored with this or that specialist truth, just so much truth as is politically safe. Useful and docile citizens, not learned ones or people trained to think for themselves, is what is desired. But the press, which is an extension of the school on its political and informative side, is controlled by the same interests, naturally, as control the school curriculum. Science and philosophy, beyond this, invent and speculate somewhat to order. Neither the Locks nor the Libnizes can ever be said in their public teaching to be free. They are in a sense freest when most controlled. I have already given you my reasons for not regarding an honest inquisition as a bad thing. If it entirely abolished the vulgarization of the best thought, confining popular teaching to a routine in the hands of the small educational bureaucracy it would have an excellent effect on the higher activities of the human mind, which should not be asked to turn teacher, but be left free to create. The zeitgeist has nothing to do with the workshop or laboratory, 
but is a phenomenon of the social world. Moving in millionaire circles, he hears today much talk of the May Fates Day intellectuals, the misdemeanors of the intellectuals, naturally. At all times he is a salon spirit, the spirit of fashion. And that sort of fashion has nothing to do with the creative intelligence, is a stranger to its habits, and lives in a different universe. If you are known to be of a revolutionary or of a pioneer complexion, a rebel, as it is called, you will be expected to call the zeitgeist by his Christian name when you meet. But in fact you will hardly speak the same language. Sorel encountered all these difficulties in the course of his revolutionary career. For instance, when he began, when he became a social revolutionary, that is, if there was one thing that was blindly accepted as part of the equipment of every revolutionary no matter of what shade of opinion, it was anti-clericalism. But Sorel, the most extreme of the French social revolutionaries of his time, was a very militant Catholic, as was Peggy. Again, he was in all his tastes a doctrinaire classicist, with Roman antiquity as his political anchor, in this resembling Machiavelli. But to the deceptions of the conventional, of those with minds composed of comfortable clichés, there is no end. The revolutionary will not even be revolutionary in the way you want him to be, and is often revolutionary about things that no one ever dreamt a person could be revolutionary about.